In this episode of the Bible Project podcast, Tim and I continue our discussion on the composition of the Bible and what it means for this book to be God's divine word. There's a tension here. The Bible emerged out of the history of Israel. But that also is met by another claim that the scriptural authors make about these writings themselves, that they are also a word from God. And so this fights us into the, you could call it the paradox or the unique category of script, the scriptures. They claim to be a divine and human word at the same time. We're going to go deep into the structure of the Bible from beginning to end, starting with the Old Testament, which is primarily the history of ancient Israel. The Hebrew Bible is a minority report on the history of Israel, told from the perspective uh, of what during Israel's history before the exile was a, a minority group, prophets, who believed that they were preserving the true heritage and history of Israel from Moses and that most of Israel had gone astray. We then talk about the New Testament books and how the disciples of Jesus claim that Israel's story was being continued with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This is a great conclusion to our overview of what is the Bible, which is all being boiled down into a video that you can find on our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining in. Here we go. So in the last episode of the podcast, we talked about how the Bible is composed. Mm -hmm. So we we spent a lot of time talking about the difference between the Hebrew Bible, the Catholic Bible, the Eastern Orthodox Bible, and the Protestant Bible. Yep. And then we talked about the Bible just as literature. What, what does it mean to be a book? We talked mm-hmm. about different types of books. And mm-hmm. um, and then we kind of created this metaphor as the Bible as an art project. Mm-hmm. And spent time talking about the literary genius of the Bible. Yeah, we Talked about being people of the book mm-hmm. and how that's part of our Christian identity. And then I just started asking you questions about what are the implications of all of this mm-hmm. for how we teach kids the Bible. Mm-hmm. And we had a little discussion on that. Mm-hmm. So... In this last half of the conversation, Mm. what I'd like to do is walk through the whole Bible and talk about what's actually in it (laughs) and the order of it and uh, give people a bird's eye view of of that. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Great. But that's uh, no small task. No small task. Let's just wrap that up in one podcast episode. So uh, if... Readers of the English Bible, you open up to your Old Testament, and, and but just go to the table of contents at the beginning. Um, you won't notice this, but there are four subsections to the Old Testament in the Christian Bible. Like the table of contents won't break it up. Into yeah, four it won't sections. give you little spaces between. It'll just be one long list of books going from Genesis all the way to Malachi. But you could break them up into four sections. Yeah, and historically, there there's a, a logic to it. Okay, and it's pretty evident once you once you see it. So the first section is the first five books. Since somewhere in the early 200s AD, has been called the Pentateuch, which means well, penta, penta, and tukas is an old Greek word for scroll. So the the scroll of five. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Those are the five. You got it. The the penta. Um, the Pentateuch. And that's right. Um, they're connected with the figure of Moses in some way, mm-hmm. traditionally. So that tells a story from creation to Abraham to the Exodus, to Israel at Mount Sinai, going through the wilderness and getting ready to enter the promised land. Yeah, Um, lots of key stories in there. Yep, and then it it ends with the death of Moses. After that comes uh, another large block of books. The story just continues on, but in what you you could call or has traditionally been called the history books. Okay. So we go then into Joshua, who takes them into the promised land. The Judges, that covers a period when Israel's in the land, organized by tribes, but with no centralized governing structures or anything, no kings. And that's why these judge characters yep. would... They're just tribal, ar- like tribal chieftains yeah. who would arise to save I wish it was called their enemies. tribal chieftains I know. instead of judges. I know. It'd make it. it a lot more interesting. Judges, it doesn't work in English because we have the word judges in yeah. English means yeah. a very specific thing that has no real correspondence to what mm. the word meant. In, why in, why in do we Hebrew. call them judges? Oh, um, uh, that's, uh, it's a very old English translation okay. of those who brought, those who brought order. Okay, they brought order. They brought order, which is true, Similar but they didn't do it by sitting in a seat <laughs> yeah, with a gavel. robe. They were like... Looking at some sort of constitution. Yeah, yeah they were tribal warriors who saved the people. What's the Hebrew enemy. word? Shoftim. 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 Judges. And then uh, you get the short story of Ruth, 
after Judges because the first line of Ruth is in the days when the judges were doing their thing. Okay, so it fits in that yep. time period. Um, then comes uh, First and Second Samuel, which is oddly named because Samuel dies halfway <laughs> at the end, like at the end of First yeah. Samuel. It's not really about Samuel; it's more about it's about David. It should be called First and Second David. But King David. There you go. Yeah, as King, we know him, King David. Yep. Yep. Uh, and so this is when the history of Israel goes from being mm-hmm. these tribes yep. with tribal from chieftains. From a federation of tribes to... A I, centralized yep. monarchy. Centralized monarchy. Yep, that's right. Big yep. shift in the history of Israel. Then First and Second Kings moves us on to Solomon, and then after his... Um, David's son. David's son. And then after he dies, there's a near civil war, and then the tribes split. The tribes up in the north form an independent kingdom. The tribes in the south, centered in Jerusalem, form the people of Judah. And then they end up as two separate peoples, kind of coexisting in tension. Until uh, Second Kings ends with uh, Babylon coming to town and taking everybody out. Hmm. First and Second Chronicles kind of get the shaft because they just retell the story of Genesis to Second Kings. Yeah. The whole history again. Yeah, the first word of Chronicles is Adam. <laughs> mm. And then the last word of Chronicles uh, has is an announcement that the people can go back from exile in Babylon, go back to the land. Um, so it's like you just read the whole story and now you get yeah. to read it again yeah. in brief. that's right. And First and Second Chronicles mostly is a retelling of Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. So mm. you're like, I just read this. Mm. But it's different. We'll talk about this. It's different in a really important way but just slightly different. Mm. And so modern readers in this order, you just, you just, just like don't, just yeah, you just skip it and go to Ezra and Nehemiah. <laughs> That's what most people do. Ezra and Nehemiah are one book in, actually, they, ha, they were one book even in early Jewish and Christian tradition. They were separated into two books in the medieval period. Mm. I, should, I should know why off the top of my head, but I don't. I don't know. It's mm-hmm. not due to scroll length. Mm. There was another factor, but I forget what it is. And then Esther... Uh, is the story set in Persia hmm. about a Jewish during community the time living exile in Persia or during the time after the exile? Like a- after exile, okay. like exiles, like a memory. But there's the still Jewish people. But living. there's a community living there, and it tells their story. Okay. Then after all that, so that was the first. Yep, first two, two sections: sections Pentateuch so, and the history books. So that was all the history books: yep. Joshua through Esther. Mm-hmm. Then uh, you take a hard turn as you go down the table of contents, and you move into the uh, books of poetry. Mm. That's how this next section is organized. It's all the po- poetry books. So Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs. I remember as a kid, if you try to open your Bible right in the middle, it's usually Psalms. Mm, mm, usually mm-hmm. land in Psalms. Well, yeah, and it's a fat book. Because yeah, so you like book, oftentimes right get to it. Yep. Yeah. Totally. So those so are all books that these are books unified. Books are all entirely that... well. Yeah, ninety nine percent written in. Poetry. Uh, poetry. Altogether, they're connected to David and Solomon, even though the books inside them, um, well, the Psalms, only half of, less than half of the Psalm, 150 Psalms are connected to David explicitly. There's all kinds of other people, authors mentioned. Mm. And Proverbs says Proverbs of Solomon at the beginning, but then there are other authors mentioned in the book itself of different mm-hmm. sections of the book. And uh, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. Job is uh, an anonymous work. And then after the poetic books, then you get the 15 books of the prophets. The three big ones. The biggies. Yep. Isaiah, yeah. Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Oh, I, excuse me. Sorry, I'm already skipping ahead. There are uh, 17 books in this section. There's 17 books in this section? <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh, okay. It's 15 books in the Jewish order. I was. We'll talk about the Jewish we, order. We will in a second. So, yeah, you get the three big ones. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then um, two smaller ones sandwiched in there. After Jeremiah is the Lamentations, and then after Ezekiel comes Daniel. And then you get um, the 12 called minor prophets in the Christian tradition. Um, and they're minor because they're small? Because of the size of the books. Yeah. yeah. Not, not it's a, not a rank in the military? No. Yeah, well, it has nothing to do with their a... importance. <laughs> these, these books are really important. So that's the shape of the uh, of the Christian Old Testament. Christian Pen- Old Testament. Pentateuch, Pentateuch yep. history, poetry, prophets. Yep, yeah. And I just know as a kid becoming familiar with the Old Testament, yeah, you've got mm-hmm. the Pentateuch. Those are the like really old stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's the history. Yeah. That's where there's a lot of bloody 
weird, oh, yeah. crazy stuff. <laughs> then the poetry, that's like where we would get some of our song, worship songs. <laughs> and then Proverbs was in there so we could yep. get some wisdom. And then Ecclesiastes is in there, and that's just a weird book that we kind of ignore. And then... <laughs> <laughs> and then the prophets, it's just kind of like, yeah, good luck. We'll kind of, we'll, yeah. we'll during Christmas time, we'll pull some Isaiah out or something. Yeah, yeah. But but beyond that, we're just kind of like, then some end of the end of the world. This is some there. weird yeah. Hebrew poetry. We don't get it. Yeah. Um. Let's yeah. just move to the Gospels. Yep. That right. was my. So that's yeah. My understanding of the Old Testament. Your experience of the Old Testament. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, there you go. So here's an uh, interesting historical factoid that order. Uh, an arrangement of the Old Testament, the earliest witness we have to that type of order, uh, hard evidence, is in a, not a Hebrew Bible, but a, a Greek, a Greek Bible. So a Greek, tra- a Greek translation. A Greek translation. So uh, people who spoke Greek were like, we want to yep. translate yes. the Hebrew scriptures yeah. into our language. That's right. We speak Greek. Yep. And it's a Christian uh, manuscript produced by Christian scribes. It dates to the mid-300s, hmm. and uh, those are our earliest large whole Bible manuscripts date to the 300s. There are many manuscripts indiv- of individual books that date earlier, hmm. but of a whole thing together in Greek, uh, the oldest one date to uh, the mid-300s, and it's in this order. So that's interesting. The, that order, from our vantage point, that order, the earliest hard evidence for that order in an old Bible is 1700 years old, which is pretty old. Yeah. It's pretty old. Right. Um, but the Old Testament's way older than that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not, and it's not. And it's not, it wasn't written in Greek. It wasn't written in Greek. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it wasn't um, mm-hmm. a Christian document. Correct. It's, pre, it's pre-Christian. So that's an interesting factoid. So layer on top of that, another set of interesting facts. When you look back at how uh, Jesus himself referred to the scriptures, which mm-hmm. for him would have been the Old Testament. Um, he refers to it uh, by its sections. And when he does it, he doesn't talk about Pentateuch, history, poetry, prophets. So at the conclusion of the Gospel of Luke in the resurrection stories where he appears and has that awesome Bible study yeah, with the disciples in the room and he has fish with them. Uh, this is in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. He says, hey, guys, listen, why are you surprised of everything that just happened over the weekend? Because a dead guy is alive. Yeah, know? yeah, I was totally. So that's why they're surprised. <laughs> it's partly. But, he's, but then he goes on to say, listen, you know, uh, this is what the Hebrew scriptures have been pointing to all along. Mm-hmm. And he says, this is what I told you when I was still with you, that everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Mm. Now, you could just take that as he's just... Yeah, he's Pick, just pulling out some of the just picking out, highlights. Yeah, the highlights. So The Old Testament highlight reel. Yeah, so the law of Moses, I guess maybe he's talking about the laws of Mount Sinai. Yeah. Point to me. Uh, the prophets, of course, sure, yeah. right? So there's a bunch of them. And the Psalms. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you if you take those three, sta- those three words, law, prophets, and Psalms, in relation to your English Old Testament, it'll he's just kind of picking out some different points in no particular order. He left out the poetry books. The stories well, in Genesis don't seem really okay, accounted for. Right. You know, the Joshua, Judges, you know, the history books. And you yeah. think, well, yeah, they're history. They're not about predictions of the future. Hmm. I'm just this is what will kind of go through your mind. If right. What you have reference to is just the... Yeah, the, Jesus is just picking out the parts of the Old Testament yeah. that make you see his relevance. Mm-hmm. That's how it would correct. seem. Yeah, correct. So that's one way to read what Jesus is doing there. However... Reading it that way is really t- taking what he's saying out of context. It's assuming that the order that we have in our English Bibles is the order or arrangement of the Bible that Jesus had. So, Which we know for a fact it wasn't. We know for a fact that it wasn't. Yeah. And what we know is that the majority way that Jewish pre-Christian and even the earliest Christian Jewish readers of the Hebrew Bible, the way they encountered the Bible, the way they thought about it, was not in four sections, but actually in three sections Mm. of the Torah, uh, the prophets, and uh, the writings. Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And we have abundant evidence for this in Jewish writings and authors contemporary with Jesus or before him. 
So, for example, among uh, the Second Temple writings that made it into the Catholic Deuterocanon, mm-hmm. there's a book called The Wisdom of Ben Sira. And uh, there's a prologue to it. And uh, Ben Sira, his name is Yeshua, Jesus. Mm. The main wisdom in the book is by uh, an old sage named Yeshua Ben Sira. But then his uh, grandson wrote a little prologue at the beginning of the book. Mm. And he says, many great teachings have been given to us through the law, the prophets, and the other writings that follow them. So my grandfather Yeshua devoted himself especially to the reading of the law, the prophets, and those other books of our ancestors. Mm. So he's got a three-part, when he thinks about the shape of the Hebrew Bible, he's got a, the same three-part shape that Jesus does, the law, the prophets, the other writings. But Jesus doesn't say the other writings, he says the Psalms. He says the Psalms, we'll talk about that. There's uh, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls makes uh, a reference to the whole of the Hebrew Bible and calls them the scrolls of Moses, the words of the prophet, and the words of David. Mm. So again, we've got this law of Moses. So they've been referred to the now prophet. so far yeah, as right. the yeah. other writings, the ah, words of David. The, the third section? Yeah, the third yeah, section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. The other writings, yeah. the words of David. And, and, or the Psalms. And the Psalms. The Psalms. And just to cap it off, Philo, uh, who was uh, lived down in Egypt, who was a Jewish philosopher writing for a Greek audience. He was trying to get a hearing in the philosophical schools, uh, Alexandria, Egypt, as a Jewish hmm. philosopher. Hmm. He refers to his Bible quite a bit, and he, he refers to the shape of his Bible as the laws, the oracles given by inspiration through the prophets, and the Psalms, hmm. along with the other books whereby knowledge and piety are increased. So he's got four categories there? Well, the law, the oracles given through the prophets, and the Psalms and the other books. Oh, as one thing. Yeah. Psalms yeah. and other books. Totally, yeah. So now for this third section, we've got the law and the prophets. That's pretty clear. It's become standard. Standard. And then we've got for another collection alongside those two, we've got Jesus says the Psalms. We've got the other books. We've got David. And we have the Psalms and the other books. Mm. So there's an awareness all through that the Hebrew Bible has this three-part shape. Mm-hmm. And that that third section is connected with David, namely the Psalms. Mm. That's the only book in the... The writings. The writings, yeah. And then when we look at the shape of the Bible transmitted through the history of Judaism, it has exactly that three-part shape. It's referred to by an acronym uh, called Tanakh. T-A-N-A-K, Tanakh. And that's an acronym. It's an acronym. The T stands for Torah, which corresponds to the Pentateuch, first five books. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, interestingly, what the Torah, comes, so the Torah, the Torah, which is which we've translated as a law, the law. Yes, that's right. Yeah, which yes went into Greek and then into English as law. Um, the Hebrew word is refers in its its most basic meaning as teaching or instruction. Okay, mm-hmm. which laws can teach and instruct you, but yeah. so can a poem mm. and so can a story. Okay. Because and, a lot of the Torah, yeah, is, a lot of the first five books yes. are stories. Yeah. The majority of it's story. The next highest majority is legal material laws. And then the third, coming in third, is a lot of, there's actually quite a lot of poetry. All of those teach just in different ways. So you've got the Torah. That's the T of the Tanakh. The N uh, stands for the Hebrew word Nevi'im, which is the Hebrew word prophet. The Torah, the law, and the prophets. So in the in the English order, the prophets come last. Mm-hmm. But in the Hebrew order, the prophets come after the Torah. And w- look at what's in the prophets. The first four books of the prophets are Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Yeah, those are history books. Yeah. So yeah, within our Christian English ordering, we think of those as history. Mm-hmm. In the Jewish tradition, those, those books are considered books of the prophets. Because prophets, in my mind, were the poetry books of the crazy guys <laughs> yeah, right. that, right, right, right. that yeah. talked about crazy things. Yeah, yeah. But Joshua, Judges, those are mm-hmm. stories about the history of Israel. Why right. do they consider those books of the prophets? Yeah, so a few things. One is the conviction that comes down through Jewish tradition that the whole of the Hebrew Bible is a prophetic work. So mm. It's the result and work of the prophets. And so what these books are is it's Israel's history told from the point of view of the prophets. And secondly, that these books are actually about Israel's future. 
they are generating hope for the future by retelling the story of their past. So it wasn't just a telling of history mm. just for the sake of telling the for history. For archival sake. For archival yeah, sake. Yeah, actually, at multiple points in the Book of Kings, the author says, hey, listen, if you want, like, the whole complete record of what Jeroboam or... All the different battles. Elijah did. Yeah, go read. He calls it the Annals of the Kings. Mm. And he refers to those books constantly. Mm. So what that tells you is that, oh... The Book of Kings actually isn't primarily a historical chronicle. Mm. He's drawn from historical chronicles to create a prophetic work, Mm. namely a work that looks at Israel's story from a divine point of view in order to to generate wisdom, to teach wisdom to God's people, and to sustain hope for the future. Mm. And that hope for the future is all about the coming kingdom of God and the Messianic king, especially in this reading order. So they're, so they're considered books of the prophets because the shape of the history yeah. and the purpose of the telling of the history yeah. is yeah. to give you hope for the future and to mm-hmm. give you a perspective on mm-hmm. why everything had happened yeah. in a particular way. And that was a unique perspective that mm-hmm. the prophets gave us. Yep. Yeah, the, base, the story arc of those four books, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, is we went into the land under the, in, on the terms of the covenant that we made at Mount Sinai, and we blew it big time. Our best kings blew it big time. And where they, you know, ran the whole ship into the ground, uh, landed the people in exile in Babylon. But from there, there have been hints all the way along that that's where the story was going. And also that that wouldn't be the end of the story, Hmm. that God was going to restore his people, bring them back from exile, and fulfill his purposes. And then what you get in the second part of the prophets are then what Christians typically call the prophets, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the 12 minor prophets. And they're the big I told you so. Yeah, totally, (laughs) yeah. Um, And they're structured as three and 12, the three big ones Mm -hmm. and 12, Mm -hmm. and it's which corresponds precisely to the story of the patriarchs in the book of Genesis. Mm, Three patriarchs? Three. Ab- Abraham, Isaac, oh. Jacob, and the Twelve. Oh. So once again, we, it's, it's uniting the past and the future hope mm. um, that God's promises to those patriarchs before Israel even blew it is actually the only hope that there is for the future. Mm. And that's what the prophets go on to develop is uh, they retell in poetry how Israel ran the ship into the ground mm-hmm. and that that's not the end of the story. They really develop the hope for God's kingdom the day of the Lord, for the coming Messiah, and Israel returning to its land so the blessing of Abraham can come to all of the nations. Mm. So that's the prophets. So, so that's, that's the law and the prophets. Yeah, you get the law and the prophets. And if, yep. yeah, so when Jesus says the law and the prophets, he's mm-hmm. referring to those he's two He's referring sections. to those two big blocks of the Hebrew Bible. Mm. Um, and then when Jesus says the Psalms, or when other Jewish authors say the other books, mm. they're referring to a diverse third collection uh, that begins with the Psalms. Mm. The Psalms is the first book of that collection. It's the K in the phrase Tanakh, which means Ketuvim. And that means Psalms? Um, Ketuvim means writings. Oh. Writings. And then uh, the ordering of the writings in, in ancient Jewish manuscripts tends to differ mm. internally within. Uh, but it makes sense. There's no, there's no un- sequential narrative unifying them. But it does seem important and intentional that Psalms is at the beginning. Mm. And uh, it also seems intentional that uh, in many Jewish orders that the Chronicles is the final book of the Ketuvim, which mm. makes it the final book of the Hebrew Bible. So it's not, Chronicles is not a, prophet, a book of the prophets. Uh, it's not among the prophets, correct. Though it has the same purpose. Mm. Um, so a, a couple things. First, we know Jesus referred to Psalm in Luke 24, the law of prophets in the Psalms, but also in a strange, unexpected way, he also refers to the ending of the Ketuvim with Chronicles. Mm. Um, it's in a, in a, a judgment oracle <laughs> that he pronounces over Israel, over Israel's leaders. Mm. In Luke chapter 11, verse 51, he says, therefore this generation, i.e. the generation of Israel's leaders that's rejecting him, um, he says, this generation will be responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed from the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. 
So it's interesting, just for starters, that he refers to Abel, hmm. Cain and Abel. Yeah. Like on page four of the Bible, he refers to him as a prophet, hmm. which is its own interesting rabbit hole hmm. to go down. But the point is, he starts with Genesis, the first murder in the hmm. Bible mm-hmm. is what he mentions. Okay. And then he mentions the blood of Zechariah. Who is a uh, prophet? Yeah, yeah, a prophet. And he's killed near the end of Second Chronicles. Hmm. Which if Jesus is working from the beginning to the end of Israel's history, Zechariah gets murdered in like the middle of Israel's history. Hmm. But that's because he's not thinking chronologically. He's thinking literarily. Hmm. He's referring to the final section of the last book of the Hebrew Bible. Hmm. Which is, sec- which is Chronicles. So from the blood, of, the blood of the prophets, from the first book of the Bible to the last book of the Bible, mm. that's what he's doing. That's the point in of that. that. In that. Interesting. So he refers to Psalms as the first book, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then this thing, he refers to Chronicles as the conclusion of the scriptures. Is the Ketavim kind of like the junk drawer a little <laughs> bit? Because there's not like a unifying, as much of mm. a unifying factor as... Um, the law, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The Torah is all the books of Moses. Mm-hmm. Then, then you've got the prophetic books. It's history and the prophets. Yeah. But then you've got like just this eclectic group. You've got mm-hmm. Psalms, which is poetry. Job, poetry. Proverbs are mm-hmm. proverbs, mm-hmm. ancient wisdom. Mm-hmm. Then in here is Ruth, mm-hmm. which is history. Yeah, a section from earlier in Israel's story. Yeah. Yeah. Song of yeah. Songs is like romance poetry. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Ecclesiastes is poetry. So we've got a lot of po- mostly mm-hmm. poetry and some mm-hmm. and some wisdom. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I can get down with that. And then yeah. Lamentations. Okay, more poetry. Yeah. But yeah. now we've got like more history. Yeah. Dan- and history. Daniel. And, history, Ezra, Nehemiah, and, and then this, then this random book, which is like a, the Chronicles, is all the history again. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, sh- uh, yes, that's at a first first glance. <laughs> that's what, it looks like the kitchen junk drawer. But remember, literary genius. Yeah. There's nothing. There's no junk drawer. There's, there's not one word <laughs> in this whole thing that's unintentionally placed. Hmm. So before we come back to what the Ketavim is and represents, you got to back up. Okay. And think about, so this is a collection of scrolls. Mm-hmm. In the Hebrew Bible, they didn't have books. Yeah, it wasn't bound together. Yeah, so this is um, a collection of scrolls that is being viewed and viewed and un- and referred to as a unified three-part whole. And all these different authors, all these different sectors of Judaism, right? Jesus up in Galilee, Dead mm-hmm. Sea Scrolls. They're out, former priests by the Dead Sea. You have a wisdom teacher in Jerusalem. You have all these different Jews, a, a Jewish philosopher down in Egypt, and they all have this, this set. sense of a... Th- of a three-part shape to the Bible, even though they've only ever encountered it in the form of individual scrolls. Yeah, that's that's good to think about. That's helpful for me because they never had everything bound together. No, so they never had someone go, "Hey, let's put yeah. a table of contents together." Yeah, the the books the books that we know of today is a um, uh, it's an invention of the Roman Roman period, mm-hmm. the Codex, post Christian. Yeah, it's called the Codex. So so yeah. they had these really long. Yeah, um, scrolls. Scrolls. Yep. And they would roll them If you've them ever up. seen the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's mm-hmm. a great representative example. They're made of uh, animal skin, parchment, mm-hmm. leather for okay. the most part. So these long leather, animal skin. Yeah, scrolls. Scrolls. Would they be like stitched together or something? Yep, like stitched. Oh, okay. Yep, stitching. And then they'd roll them up and one book would be on there? Or would a book be broken up uh, with many scrolls? Um, it, it depends. Yeah, mostly it would be in the individual books of the Hebrew Bible corresponded to a scroll, a scroll, a single scroll. Yeah. yeah, you don't get all the books of the five books of the Torah on single scrolls in, until a, a later period like, and that in would be Judaism. A Torah scroll, and you call it a Torah scroll. Yeah. So okay, so I'm imagining as an ancient mm-hmm. Jew, I and I have access to a collection of scrolls, mm-hmm. which would be not very many people. It'd be yeah. like your synagogue. Mm. Yeah, not very many people. Your synagogue. And you've yeah. got to you got to put them in some sort of order. And traditionally, yeah. mm-hmm. people are like, okay, these five scrolls. This is a set. This is a collection, mm-hmm. and that's the the Torah. Yeah. And then these, how many are in the center section? Seventeen, you said. Um, it's four plus fifteen. Dean so you'd have this collection of nineteen, 19 scrolls. Yeah. And actually, sorry, the the minor prophets were all were always connected on one scroll. Oh, okay. Oh, so it'd only be It'd be four scrolls for the prophets. Four scrolls. 
Oh, for uh, sorry, uh, it would be twelve. Uh, let's see, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings would each be one, mm. and then it would be four more: Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, so and the twelve, eight scrolls. So yeah, so you'd have you'd have these five scrolls. You'd <laughs> five call scrolls. Them the, the, Tanakh, the eight scrolls. You'd have of the eight prophets. scrolls, and you call them the prophets. <laughs> yeah, and then you'd have a collection of other mm-hmm. scrolls, and you'd mm-hmm. call them the Ketuvim, the writings. Yep. Yep. And that tradition of how they are placed together yeah. and thought of together as a collection yeah. was p- passed on to you. Yes. Yeah. It's not like written in a table of contents or anything. Correct. Yeah. You just that's how you think of this collection of scrolls. Yes. Yes. So here's and all what, three sets together yeah, yeah. to you are your ancient scriptures. Yep. Yeah. That's the idea. So rabbit hole goes a little deeper. Um, mm-hmm. If you wanted to create some kind of system, some kind of inter cross referencing linking system to help create sequence and order out of that, and you're working with the technology of scrolls, where are you most likely? Where is an editor who wants to bring coherence to this big collection? most likely to do their work. Um, and it's, it's fairly obvious if you work with scroll technology because you open it up and it's either the beginning or you've read it all the way through and the outer leaf is the end. Oh, okay. So uh, if you look at the beginnings and the, the first words and the last words of all the books of the Hebrew Bible, you'll start to notice things that are really interesting. Um, you'll start to notice what look like little editorial linking reference notices. Mm. If you look at the first lines of all the books of the Torah, they're all interlinked together. And if you look at the last lines of the books of the Torah, or in the last chapter of all the books of the Torah, you'll see that there are these little referencing mechanisms that either link back to the first line of the book or that get you ready to read the next line of uh, the opening scroll. What would be an example of that? Um, Oh, so one, yeah, one example is uh, the the book of Exodus opens up with, these are the names of the um, sons of Jacob that went down into Israel. And it gives you a list. Mm-hmm. But you've read that list before. Mm-hmm. You just read it a couple chapters ago near the ending of the book of Genesis. Mm. So the beginning of Exodus actually picks up and condenses a whole section out of the very the ending of Genesis and makes it the beginning of the story of Exodus. So it's a... A way of, of connecting the, the ending of Genesis and the beginning of the next scroll. So you're saying very likely the scroll of Exodus could have not had that. And someone with access mm. to that scroll yeah. said, you know, I want to make this really fit more yeah. fluidly yeah. from Genesis to Exodus. So yeah. I'm going to rewrite and paraphrase mm-hmm. the ending of Genesis. Mm-hmm. And, the only, and I'm going to put it here at the beginning of the scroll because I have some room. Yeah, totally. I, you can see this everywhere. All the all the um, books of the prophets begin with little superscription headings hmm. that are all cross-referencing um, different moments in the book of uh, Kings. Hmm. Verbatim, just lifted right, phrases right out of the book of Kings. Hmm. So every book of the prophets, in some way, uh, is being linked back. It's like hyperlinks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on like a web page? Mm-hmm. It's like hyperlinking you back into the the story of the prophets, Joshua, mm-hmm. Judges, Samuel, Kings, that you just read. So there's intelligent life here at work in this three-part shape. So th- the books are all kind of linked together that way. But it, So I guess to yeah. take a step back, because this is a new thought for me and for many mm. people who grew up with the Bible mm. or, or, or have become familiar with the Bible in some way, is that this collection of books, in my imagination, was always just handed down oh, from sure, God sure. Yes, in yes. this form. And yeah, through different people at different points in history. Mm-hmm. But it was like, here, here's the book of Exodus completed. Mm-hmm. Here's the book of mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, whatever minor prophet in yes. its completion. Yes. And then that was with fidelity, mm. copied mm-hmm. over and over and over, never changed. Yeah. Because as soon as you start... Introducing this idea of, well, actually, editors. There was or, an editor, yeah. and he put in a new yeah. introduction. That's just not a category of mm. the, how the Bible was formed. Yeah. Okay. Mind. All right. Yeah. Let's pause. Let's talk about that for a second. So, two things. One, there's nothing in the Bible that um, claims that these books were written all com- in as complete first editions, mm-hmm. in as individual works that were only brought together once they were each completed on their own. Okay. Like, there's nothing in the Bible that claims that. Okay. Second, there's nothing in 
the history of human writing that tells us that that's how books are actually produced. <laughs> <laughs> Even in the modern period. Yeah, but if it's going to be a book books that produced. God's going to give you because he wants you to know the truth about reality, you think he, he would do it that way? Why? Eventually. Why do you think he... Why? Just be a lot cleaner. According right? to whom? Well, I mean, why? You know, I mean, think about it. <laughs> Like, if I wanted a document... I am thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> if I wanted a document that told me with accuracy and fidelity mm. what life was really about, mm. and I wanted to know with absolute certainty that this came from God, then it seems like if I was God, I would go, okay, I'll give him something foolproof. I'm going to give him <laughs> something just completed yeah right off the bat just here it is in its completion yeah. there's no evolution of this and it's going to predict things in the future so specifically and accurately and completely and then no one can ever argue and be like well yeah maybe maybe yeah. some maybe joe wrote this no how would joe have written this uh, you know like uh, um then it becomes foolproof yeah and i feel like as I'm saying that, it's obvious that's not what we have, but yeah, but it's kind of what I think I expected to find. Interesting. And when we talk about yeah. all these yeah. prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, or all these prophecies that are going to be fulfilled, mm. that was always a proof mm. of like, obviously, this is divine because mm. look, who can predict the future? Yeah. How is it possible that yeah, yeah, these 500 prophecies were fulfilled? Of course, it's a divine book, and so that's just kind of my category. Yeah, sure. Of this is what a book yeah. that came from God must look like. Yeah, um, man, it's really it's a big, big conversation. Um, that m mindset is a is a modern construct. It's a modern Western construct mm -hmm. um, that's imposing onto the Bible standards of certainty, and uh, it's it's imposing on the Bible a view of what Christians have called inspiration. Yeah, a, a term meaning how human authors were used by God to write these books. Mm -hmm. It's imposing a view of inspiration onto the Bible that you don't actually find in the Bible. Because mm -hmm. the Bible contains all kinds of records about the origins of its writings. Jeremiah 36, for as one example, uh, Jeremiah senses God calling him to collect all of his poems and essays and prophecies over a period of 20 years mm -hmm. and put them together into a scroll. So he doesn't do it himself. He hires a professional scribe to do it. Mm. And how long did that take? I can't even imagine... I only have seven years worth of sermons. <laughs> and the thought of compiling all those work. together. Yeah. Sheesh. So he does it. Mm. He, he, Baruch does it. The guy, the guy, the scribe's name is Baruch. And then he gives it to the kings and priests and they burn it. it the contents make them so angry. Mm. So then he senses God calling him to make another edition. <laughs> this is all in Jeremiah 30, chapter 36. Mm. So they make a second edition and the last line of the chapter is, so Baruch wrote down the words and put it all down. And then the last line is, and many similar words were added to them. So you're like, wait, edition two of Jeremiah is longer than edition one. Mm. And what does that mean, similar words? Yeah, what does that mean? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. There's like eight different interpretations of what that could mean. Is, is a extra poetry of Jeremiah that he forgot to include in edition one? Is it... Baruch's poetry? Is it someone else's? Mm. But that was related to the same themes. And mm. so you, it also is maddeningly ambiguous. Mm. But it at least tells us that this book went through multiple editions and a process of expansion through those editions. Mm. And you can see that in the book of Proverbs. You know, it says Sol Proverbs of Solomon at the beginning, but you finish the book and pay attention to the headings of different little collections. And you've also got in there sayings of the wise. You have the sayings of Solomon that the men of Hezekiah put in the book 200 years later <laughs> after Solomon. And then the book concludes with a collection of riddles from a guy named Agur, who we have <laughs> no idea. Who, it's, it's not a Hebrew name. And then from a, a, a king, a non-Israelite king named Lemuel, but it's actually wisdom that his mother taught him, we're told. <laughs> <laughs> So, so someone collected this all together. To clearly, someone yeah. long after Solomon collected. And we talk, I think yeah. we talked about this when we were yeah. talking about the Proverbs, and I was wrestling through the same totally. thing, which yeah. is 
that's not the clean version of divine right. scripture that I have is some guy going, yes, you know, I'm going to collect a bunch of really cool riddles and sayings <laughs> yeah. from Israelites, non-Israelites, put them all together. And yeah, I mean, let's not go here, down this rabbit here, hole. Of yeah, light. but here's, here's what's at the root. And I, this is important. I don't think we've talked about this before. Underneath that modern construct of a Bible like golden tablets dropped out of heaven Mm -hmm. is a view of how God works in the world by his spirit. Namely, that if God is at work in the world, it means that humans are not. Yeah, they're bypassed. Or if humans are involved, it's just incidental. Like their their brains were zapped and they just were writing out these scrolls in a trance, not understanding anything. But underneath that is, yeah, it's this idea that if humans are at work, God is not at work. Yeah. If God is at work, then humans either aren't in- involved or they're only incidentally involved. And that is completely foreign to th- the view of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit in the Bible. It just makes things a lot messier. It makes it, it yes, it, totally. It, it means God has chosen to work in human history through humans. And it's the same issue with the Christian doctrine of the incarnation, of that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. Jesus mm-hmm. didn't drop out of heaven speaking alien. You know? Yeah. He was born and he grew up speaking Aramaic. <laughs> and, uh, you know? Yeah. But somehow we expect... no one would have understood him. Yeah, we expect the alien. Bible to have dropped out of the sky <clears throat> almost like independent of its origins. And uh, that's... Or, and we expect it to have been written and produced in a way that is n- unlike any other way that books were produced in that time period. Sure. And I just, again, I think we're imposing a strange and foreign set of assumptions onto mm-hmm. the Bible there. Okay. Well, it <laughs> rattles the brain. Yeah. It's, from... a, new, it's a new paradigm that's, that's based in a- actual historical evidence. And that... what makes it, I think, uncomfortable is that then the question becomes, well... If a if a biblical book can be edited, mm. and that mm-hmm. was divinely inspired mm-hmm. editing, that's yeah, that's part of how God, yeah, that's the, part of how God. The end result is that God speaks to His people through these writings, yeah, and these writings can ha- have come about through all kinds of different ways. Then you know what? When is that complete? When is that process complete? Yes, yes. And I feel like we've established mm-hmm. from our point of view now. We look back and we say this is complete, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Don't don't mess with it. Yeah, the don't final edition. We've we've finalized it. Yeah, yeah. And what? So was that? When's the final edition? When was the final edition? And yes. was that final edition? Yeah, God's yeah, yeah. Fi- like yeah, final um, yeah. So edition. <laughs> establishing what the wording of the final edition is, is the goal of a whole field of biblical scholarship called textual criticism. Mm. And uh, I fell in love with this field. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote my dissertation mm. on a niche topic within this field because um, it involves ancient Hebrew manuscripts, the Dead Sea Scrolls, ancient Greek manuscripts, ancient Aramaic. It's so awesome. The, uh, this, the Bible's textual history um, is open, public, open to lots of historical you know, um, investigation. There's no secrets here, and it's complex. It's, it's not simple. But once you wade through all of it, uh, we, we know the, the Bible's text history, and uh, we can, uh, with reasonable confidence, you know, say we have a firm grip on what the basic final edition was of the Bible, but it take, it's taken a lot of work to And what do there. we mean by final edition? Yeah, well, it, it's complicated. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it sounds complicated. It, it is, it's complicated, um, because it's all about, well, what text manuscript witnesses do we have? Um, we have some from the medieval period that have been really important. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have ancient Greek translations. Because those were final at that time in history. Yeah, totally. So right? what, So and and... Add to all of this, I'm a follower of Jesus. Yeah. So what I'm interested in is, is the Tanakh that Jesus read. Mm. The only reason uh, me as a Scottish Gentile, <laughs> you know, Portland skateboarder American. on the other part of the planet yeah. is wants to read the Hebrew Bible 2,000 years later is not because I just find it interesting. It's because I follow Jesus. Yeah. 
And he said these books bear witness to him. And So you're help. most interested in what was the Bible Jesus wrote? I, as a Christian, I want to know and get in touch with the Bible Jesus read, which wasn't in English <laughs> and uh, wasn't in Greek, though uh, Greek was is a very, knowing Greek and the Greek translations is really important for uncovering the history of the Bible. But I want, I want to read the Bible Jesus read as close as I can. Yeah, there's a, a line that Jesus says to some Jewish leaders that he's in an argument with in the Gospel of John. He says to them, you guys are experts in the scriptures. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Hmm. And then he says, these are the scriptures that bear witness to me. Hmm. And there in, a, it's a very, in one verse, I think you have a nutshell of getting, getting the horse first hmm. <laughs> and then the cart. In Jesus' mind, the reason the scriptures are a divine word is not because you are being invited to a personal relationship with a book. You're invited to have a personal living connection to Jesus, the risen Messiah. And the reason I read the Bible is because it's the divine and human word that points me to Jesus. Mm -hmm. It points forward from the Old Testament, and then for the New Testament, it points me backward. Mm -hmm. And it all centers on the person of Jesus. It puts Jesus, the living Jesus, who I don't know apart from the Bible, mm -hmm. but at the same right, time, yeah. the, the Jesus that I, I know is the, the Jesus Bible. rendered, represented for me in the pages of Scripture. But at the same time, Jesus isn't the Bible. <laughs> the Bible is a literary text that tells me and points me to an actual person mm. who has a close connection to these texts, but yeah. isn't the same thing. He's an act just like he's a person, just like I could read your biography, but I'm sitting across the table right now talking to you. Mm -hmm. And you are not the same thing as the book that could be written about you. But once I'm dead, that's <laughs> all we're going to have. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, my, you would need to be the son of God biography. whose spirit could be present with us as I read the book and <laughs> come and And come. that's the difference between and, me and Jesus. Uh, yeah, that's the difference. That's right. So the, the focus on what it means that the scriptures are inspired or uh, a divine and human word doesn't mean that they weren't produced through normal human processes. Um, what it means is that the message that these books communicate is a message God wants his people to hear that points them to the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. And you're right. I've, I've been living in this paradigm for a long time, but I went through a paradigm shift to get to this space. Yeah. And every time I teach through the shape mm -hmm. of the Tanakh, this is exactly the conversation that comes that up. Ends up yeah, the coming every up. time I've talked about the composition and unity of the Tanakh, it's it, like, well, wait a second. It raises this very question. You're shattering yeah, yeah, firm yeah. categories I was holding. So that's how we got here. That's how we got here. The editorial yeah. unity of the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> so to kind of finish off this conversation on the Old Testament then, we, we Christians, um, Protestant and Catholic, mm -hmm. call it the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. And um, in Hebrew, it was just the scriptures. The Bible, the, the scriptures. Bible, yep. And also referred to as the Tanakh mm -hmm. because that's an acronym for the three parts. Correct. TNK. Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Mm -hmm. I remember in college uh, learning this for the first time, not really digging really into it, but kind of hearing, oh, there's mm. a different Hebrew ordering. And I didn't really understand it, mm. but I knew of it. Because mm -hmm. I wasn't as geeky as you. <laughs> <laughs> and remember thinking to myself, wow, is it important that I read the Hebrew ordering of uh, the Old Testament? Uh -huh. Is there something more mm. spiritual or <laughs> more, uh, you know, like, is yeah. that more biblical? Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I, um, I've had a hard time over the years tr trying to find a fair way to talk about this. The two orders, the English ordering... It may, there's a logic to it. You tell the basic story of Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have the poetry and wisdom of Israel, and you have the prophets, like a ski jump at the end of a steep hill. <laughs> and the prophets launch you off into the future hope of the Messiah and yeah. the kingdom of God. Makes sense. Um, the Tanakh also launches you into the hope of the Messiah and the kingdom of God, but in a different way. Mm. That hope is emphasized actually from the beginning. And then the prophets as a whole to have their own ski jump. And then the writings themselves are a whole ski jump. Um, the the three-part shape, we haven't talked about this, but the three-part editorial unity 
is itself designed at every step to pitch you forward into future hope for the Messiah and the coming kingdom of God. And it's because the ordering of the books highlights those ski jumps mm. in a way that the English ordering uh, doesn't highlight. Okay. And it has to do with how the ending of Deuteronomy and the beginning of Joshua work together. And those would be beginnings and ending of scrolls. Which and is the same in our uh, tradition. It is the same in our. And if you pay attention, you'll notice something there. But what's going on there... But at the at the scholars call it the literary seam between mm. the Torah and the prophets is directly connected to the literary seam between the prophets and the writings, the mm. Nevi'im Ketuvim. Mm. If you go read the final paragraph of Deuteronomy and then go read the final paragraph of the prophets, which is Malachi, mm -hmm. you'll notice electricity, editorial electricity <laughs> connecting those two. Mm. And then if you read the opening of the prophets, the first lines of the scroll of the prophets, and then the first line of the first scroll of the writings, the Psalms, you'll see editorial electricity. Mm. And all those passages are talking to each other. Mm. They, they are a part of the editorial unification of the whole Hebrew Bible. And all of these passages are about immersing yourself in these scriptures mm -hmm. as you're waiting the future coming day of the Lord. Mm. You're awaiting the future prophet who's going to bring the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And what's the day of the Lord on into uh, the Psalms? It's all about the coming messianic uh, son of David who will bring the kingdom of God. Mm. So the three-part shape of the Tanakh is pre-Christian and it's, mess it's messianic. It's future pointing. And that's exactly why Jesus says what he says. Didn't I tell you, everything had to be fulfilled that was yeah. written in the Torah, mm. in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Jesus read his Bible as the Tanakh as a big neon sign point, <laughs> pointing to the future hope of the Messiah and the kingdom of God, and that's what he came to fulfill. So I, I think reading the Bible in Tanakh order is an important practice that Christians ought to recover. And you can do this. Uh, you can go to your bookstore. Well, most people don't have bookstores. Go to Amazon. <laughs> go to your Amazon. Your bookstore and go look for the Jewish Publication Society's uh, version of the <clears throat> English translation of the Bible. And it'll be, it's called Tanakh. It's actually mm. called Tanakh. Mm. T-A-N-A-K. You can get it for like 12 bucks on Amazon. Does Zondervan or anyone bind uh, Old Testament, New there Testament no together? There are no Christian Tanakh publishers board? that uh, publish an English translation of None? Tanakh. Zero? Zero. That's... There are um, there are some uh, modern Jewish translations of the Old and New Testaments, um, and they'll organize it that way, but they're very obscure publishers or they're not mainstream at all. Mm -hmm. And I get it. For the major publishers, there's no money. So wait, there's some, there's no money in selling. There's some niche publishers who might do it. Uh, he, yeah, let's hold on. Yeah, here we go. A Messianic Jewish scholar named David Stern who, through a small press called Lederer Messianic Publications published a English version of the Tanakh and of the Berit Chadashah, which is Hebrew for New Testament. You can get it on Amazon, Kindle for 12 bucks, a paperback for 30 bucks or 20 bucks used. It's called the Complete Jewish Bible. What translation is he using? Mm. In the Complete Jewish Bible? Yeah. Mm. The Complete Jewish Bible shows the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, a unified Jewish book meant for everyone, Jew and non-Jew alike. This text refers to the bonded leather edition. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, it's cool because he gives you uh, Hebrew, the, he the Hebrew names of mm. Old Testament characters. Oh, okay. So that way uh, they don't get butchered as they do in most English translations. Like James in the New Testament is Jacob, Jacob. Okay. So, that's so, cool. so it is a different, it's just a completely different translation. Yeah, it might be his own translation. I think it is. Yeah, I'm his highly reviews. acclaimed English translation. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, it's his. There you go. For followers of Yeshua, this is a good translation that deserves its spot on your study shelf, along with your NIV and yeah. ASB. Yeah, it's awesome. You won't read the Bible the same way. It'll really transform how you read the Bible. All right, cool. So, um, next we'll talk about the New Testament. Yeah.
Okay, so that's the Tanakh. Um, and then... Yeah. The, so let's just talk about the makeup of the New Testament really quick. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're talking about um, 27 books that all emerged out of the events, you know, ignited by Jesus of Nazareth. And they are all written by Israelites, Jews, uh, who became disciples of Jesus. And then... During the Second Temple. During the Second Temple period, late Second Temple period. And then um, as the Jesus movement spread after his death and resurrection, uh, they, a certain circle that Jesus appointed became figures called apostles. And then the books of the New Testament all stem from that circle of apostles. Most were written by the apostles or some were commissioned by or originated from, even if they weren't written by the apostle themselves. So you have four accounts of the life of Jesus mm -hmm. connected to... Um, the apostles, Peter, Matthew. Which one's Peter connected to? Uh, the Gospel of Mark. Matthew for Matthew. Um, the Gospel of Luke, uh, it's tricky. Many people associate it with the circle of Paul because we know Luke was a co-worker of Paul's. Mm. And then John. Then you get, uh, after the four accounts of Jesus, you get the book of Acts, which is also from the same author as the Gospel according to Luke, mm -hmm. which ends with Paul spreading the Gospel all the way to Rome. Then you get a collection of Paul's 13 letters addressed to seven churches mm. total. It's interesting. The first one being Rome. You finish Acts, mm. which has Paul in Rome, mm -hmm. and then you turn the page and it's Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Which is one of his old yep. his letters. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's written late in his career. Oh, and so interesting fact, right, is these letters are ordered by their length. Right? They're ordered by their length, not by their date. date. Yep, that's why Philemon's last. So that the ordering, is first. yeah, and that ordering, hmm, uh, there's actually, I, I have some homework to do on the ordering of the Pauline collection, the collection of Pauline letters. But um, yeah, so that ordering obscures some interesting relationships. So it doesn't, it makes you think that Romans is first, when yeah. in fact, it's one of the latest, most mature expressions of his entire theology. But it's longest, so it's perfect. It's the longest, yeah. Uh, as far as we can tell, First Thessalonians, for complex reasons, it's to be the earliest letter of Paul. Hmm. So after Paul's letter, and also there's an important relationship, for example, between Colossians and Philemon. I think they're meant to be read back to back hmm. and as connected because they refer to the, all the same. But and it goes people. Ephesians, Colossians. But yeah, instead it's um, go uh, yeah, Colossians. No, yeah, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so can the, we, with the gospels really quick since we're mm. talking about ordering. Oh what's yeah. What's the tradition oh. of ordering the gospel? Oh yeah, boy. Um, I have more homework to do there, too. I know the ordering of Matthew as the first of the four is pretty old. Um, and by old, I mean maybe to the mid-100s or so, when our first evidence of the four being written, collected together. But historically, the consensus position in New Testament scholarship that I think is right is that the Gospel of Mark is the oldest, okay. it's the first. And that Matthew uh, and Luke both drew upon Mark as one of their sources because they knew that it came from the testimony of Peter. Mm. And then John um, stands last in terms of the four to be written. But they're all written uh, before the end of the first century. So they're ordered Matthew first. Oh, yeah. So uh, here's my hunch. And, I'm, and my hunch is more that like I've heard some other scholars say it. And um, is Matthew is easily the... M the most accessible, and it's the, the version of Jesus' life that's most designed to be taught in a local church community. Hmm. And I learned this from experience because I did it. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's right. You guys went through the book. Yeah, and actually part of the reason why I advocated for taking a year and a half of Sundays in the local church where uh, I contribute to the teaching was Matthew designed this for to be the a gospel that is taught for mm. a living community. Mm. That's why he's gathered all of Jesus' teachings that are scattered in different places um, in Mark, but in Matthew, he's organized them all into five really nice blocks of Jesus' teaching. He's super methodical, how he stages the for story forward. So Matthew is an excellent gospel to teach a whole church through if you want to orient mm -hmm. them to the complete story and teachings of Jesus. It's more complete? Uh, yeah, it, it's, well, by complete, I just mean um, Matthew's trying to give you a well-rounded, full-orbed presentation of Jesus 
in a methodical way mm. in terms of how he's designed yeah. the story with story and then blocks of teaching, more narrative, more blocks of teaching. Mm. Um, so we don't really know why they were ordered that way. There was not a simple like, well, it goes in order of length, like the epistles. No, it's not in order of length. Yeah. So uh, there may be um, some I've got in my Amazon wish list to to big treatments on the formation of the four gospel canon. But because okay. a lot of it has to do with our manuscript evidence. Because it is kind of weird that Luke wouldn't come last to I know. match Acts. Yeah, Luke obviously wrote two works that go together. But at some point, yeah, er, er, early out. church communities viewed there was a greater value in seeing Luke as part of this four-part collection of the Gospels than, as than, the, two-parter. Di- than the two-part volume Luke Acts. Because it could have easily been Matthew, Mark, John, John, and then Luke Acts. Correct. Yeah. But that's not. Yeah, that's right. And because Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a unique relationship because they drew upon a common source mm, so material, they, they go together. They have been preserved as a triad. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then, okay, so, and then we get to Paul's letters. We talked about those. Paul's letters. Then uh, there's got, more letters after that. Got, uh, then, then it's the, what do you do, the top 10 list of the apostles. So it's Peter. Um, and then John. Peter has two letters written to uh, bro- uh, as circular letters to many different church communities. Mm. Um, then you have John's three letters, mm-hmm. first, second, third John, the first of which, the longest, first John, is not even a letter at all. It's a sermon, early Christian sermon. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you get Jesus. Are those, are those in order of length or date or anything? Oh, uh, it's not self-evident what okay. the order of writing was. Lots of different views on that. Okay. Um, but they are in order of length. They are in order of length, yep. Yeah, long, less long, long. medium, short. Short, yep, <laughs> correct. Yep, um, you have the letter of James, uh, Jesus' brother, although there's some people think that it's from James, who was one of the 12, okay. this, um, son of Zebedee, but um, uh, the majority position that I think is more likely is that it's Jesus' brother. And then the next letter then, um, Jacob. No, that's no James. excuse me. Yeah, James. James also, um, it, more literally, Jacob. Jacob, yeah, sorry, his Hebrew name's Jacob. 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 Uh, and then no. Jude is also Jesus' brother. He wasn't one of the circles of the 12, but we know that Jesus' brothers became missionaries mm. and church leaders after him. Paul mentions that in his first letter to the Corinthians. Um, and we're not going in order here, <laughs> and then canonical order. And then we also have one anonymous uh, early Christian sermon in the New Testament, letter form, uh, which is Hebrews, which as traditionally for some amount of church history was associated with Paul. And even in some early manuscripts was included within the Paul's letter collection. Canonically um, it goes... Um, okay, so the order of the New Testament letters then goes from the letters of Paul, then to Hebrews, then to the James. anonymous letter. Yep, anonymous letter. Two letters of Peter, um, three letters of John, one letter of Jude. Yeah. Those are the epistles. Those are the letters of the New Testament. Yeah. yeah. And is there any reason why they were ordered that way that you know of? I mean, it makes sense for Paul that Paul's correspondence that rose to the surface, yeah. the ones He's that first. went viral, um, that that would be collected. And then, you know, you have this hit list, James, Peter, John. You have Peter and John, two of Jesus' closest disciples. And then you have James and Jude, two of his brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got this pretty complete representation of the apostles and yep. the leaders closest well, why throw to the Hebrews apostles. Hebrews right there in the mix. Yeah, Hebrews uh, uh, is self-aware as being um, a document that comes from a disciple of the apostles. Yeah. In, in chapter two, or no, chapter one, he talks about, listen, we are those who have heard mm-hmm. from those who heard the Lord. Mm. And so the author, the pastor, I call him, um, the pastor of Hebrews is writing to a church community that he's scared, Jewish church, Jewish Messianic Jewish community, that he's scared is going to abandon faith in Jesus. And so he leverages the teaching of the apostles. That's what he says in, in, in the sermon's opening. Hmm. So, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, Hebrews is really interesting. Hmm. But, um, uh, again, so much, this is getting into the history of the canon, for how these letters rose to the top. Um, was not through getting voted by councils. Mm. It was through the growth of the Jesus movement and what letters and literature stemming from the apostles went viral and rose to the top. And Hebrews was among that list, even though it wasn't directly 
authored by an apostle. At least it doesn't claim that mm. in the document itself, like Paul's letters do or Peter's. Um, it, but it does claim to be passing on the teachings of the of the original apostles, and so it rose to the top. And it's powerful. Hebrews is powerful. So Back anyway, a punch. So then this all ends with uh, then the revelation. Yeah, an which, early Jewish Christian apocalypse. A Jewish <laughs> Christian apocalypse, <laughs> <laughs> or a Christian Jew who wrote an apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> and an apocalypse, we know what those are from other. Uh, books in the Old Testament, right? Um, yeah, other, yeah. There are parts of uh, the parts books of, of books. the prophets in the Hebrew Bible that communicate through uh, the prophet having a fantastic dream or vision, uh, and then he meets some kind of mediator, usually angelic type figure, who explains what the meaning of his v dream or vision is. Yeah, Ezekiel has one of those. Isaiah, Zechariah. Um, and so in Second Temple Judaism, that media, let's think back to the analogy of the art project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would be one of the ways that yeah. Scott... That the, might be spoken word. Yeah, the little spoken word. Or something. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, oh, this is one of the apocalyptic sections. Yeah. Of there's a dream or a vision, I guess, right. explained. Yeah. And this, so, is, this is interpretive dance. It's probably... It's a, <laughs> it's a violent interpretive dance. So... Um, yeah. So then out of that, in the amazingly productive literature of the Second Temple Jewish communities around Jerusalem, there were produced whole books that were apocalypses. The most significant ones throughout history have been a book called First Enoch, a book called uh, Fourth Ezra, and Second Baruch hmm. are the most significant ones. And they read very much like the New Testament book of Revelation. Hmm. The prophet has a dream or a vision, fantastic symbols, and then they're interpreted and made relevant to the community the author wants to write to. Mm. And so what we have in, yeah, the revelation is John, and whether that's the Apostle John or whether it's a Jewish Christian prophet who traveled around the seven churches that he writes to, mm. but who's not an apostle. Oh, we don't know for sure. Uh, there's strong arguments on either side. Mm. But yeah, he has he had a series of dreams or visions and then composed all of them together into this incredibly profound and sophisticated literary work that he calls the revelation of Jesus. And so it comes that also emerges out of the life of the early church, just like all the other letters do. But he's aware of himself speaking to the whole community of Jesus followers all over the world. And he's trying to help them, trying to motivate them towards faithfulness in light of the coming persecution he knows is on the horizon. It makes sense that this one's last because mm. it talks very specifically mm. about the end of the age. Yeah, apocalypse is by nature. The prophet would have a dream or vision and it would give them, uh, scholars talk about two dimensions that are opened up for the prophet. One's vertical. So usually there's a heavenly throne room. The prophet has a vision of God's throne. Mm. And so it gives them this heavenly vantage point on current events and history. But then it also gives them a horizontal viewpoint of able to Seeing view the yeah, view the present moment in light of the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises, which is the return of the Messiah, the kingdom of God, heaven and earth reunited, mm. evil vanquished forever. Yeah. And so apocalypses give a heavenly vantage point on history, What's going viewing on current events in light of history's final outcome yeah. in the kingdom of God. Mm. It's fitting, obviously fitting that the revelation is the capstone of the Christian Bible because it's about how the story ends and therefore how to live in the present in light of the story's end. Mm. So there's a, yeah, there's a question. Was John aware of himself as writing the final book of the Bible? <laughs> but I think in... Let me finish this thousand yeah, year project off. Yeah, but I mean, um, that's uh, technically it's called an anachronism because even the collection of all those 27 writings wasn't all together in one place yet. They had all been, they all were in existence yeah. by then. Right. And they were being read, but not everybody had all of Paul's letters yet. Mm -hmm. They were still getting circulated around. Yeah. And so it's, it took another period of time for these 27 works stemming from the circle of the apostles to become universally acknowledged and recognized as Holy Scripture. Which is a story for another time. Which is a story for another time. But that's the shape shape of the Bible.
That's it for our discussion on what the Bible is. You can find the video we made on this topic. It's on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash The Bible Project. It's also on our website, thebibleproject.com. Coming up next on the podcast is going to be a discussion on the Holy Spirit. Tim and I had a lot of fun going through the theme of God's Spirit through the narrative arc of Scripture and seeing how instrumental God's Holy Spirit is to the Christian life. So make sure to subscribe to this podcast if you haven't so that you can get that episode when it comes out. And it'll also be our next theme video on our YouTube channel and on our website. Say hi to us on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. And if you like this podcast, please give it a review. It helps a lot in the exposure of this project. Thanks so much for being a part of this with us. Thank you.